What's up? So I decided to do a Q&A today. Here's what we got. Thank you guys for asking uh, your questions. Now I'm gonna do this one a little bit differently. I'm gonna select some of these and I have some of my uh, super friends gonna join in and answer some of these for you as well. Really hope you enjoy this. A little something different. Um, should be good, so. I'm gonna kick off and answer a couple of these as well. Kind of uh, in the middle of while I'm training, but that training footage will be not for you today. Let's uh, let's go random town. Here's an easy one. Thoughts on chiropractic for strength athletes. I am totally for it. Uh, during my season when I'm training, I try to go see a chiropractor, damn, once a week? When I'm really feeling beat up and I'm traveling a lot and I need some extra relief that I just can't get on my own from doing recovery work. I also see a massage therapist for that question. Uh, about the same amount of time, I know it's a little bit pricey, but since I am competing in a sport that does pay me, it allows me to get a little bit extra recovery to make, to keep myself ready to throw the next weekend, right? So investing a hundred bucks in a massage that week from the, you know, between a thousand and three thousand I made the weekend before competing, seems like a good uh, investment to me. Mike Kaji. Active recovery ideas. What would you do? What would you do? Uh, like, would I do Metcons as active recovery? Best foods for recovery. I don't know as far as food goes. I'm still really figuring out this nutrition thing. Um, calories are going to be important, period. So you can't be in a big caloric deficit and recover as good as you would be if you were in a surplus. This may not be going along with whatever your plans are at that moment, but for me as a performance athlete late in the season, I tend to eat my face off. I'm trying to make some changes ahead of the game now so that I don't have to do that as drastically this year. Um, and as far as your other question of using Metcons, I do love this. I like to get in and do kind of some quick workouts to help get the body flowing, get things moving. Even if I've been traveling all day, get off a flight, I get home. Just gives me the ability to get some things moving and then maybe just spend some time doing a little bit of mobility. I never want to do this, that's the thing. But I always feel much better after I do it. So. The recovery work, mobility work, is gonna pay off dividends afterwards. Thanks for the question. So one of the questions it seems I'm getting a lot is like go-to recovery methods, quick recovery methods, and the truth of the matter is, is recovery is gonna be just the same as it's gonna be training. It, there aren't any cheap, quick, fast recovery methods that are gonna be give you any real carryover. It's gonna take a lot of work and it's gonna take being consistent for it to really make a difference. Being consistent that after you train a heavy leg day, say you also spend some time afterwards smashing those muscles out, also flossing and rolling and maybe some contrast bath, things like that. That's a method that I don't see people using a whole lot of. And that one's kind of easy. You can do that at home. Simply just a hot and cold shower works, but really works better if you can actually get into an ice bath and then into a hot tub. That's not in everyone's ball game. I'm aware of that. Hell, it's not even in mine. So hot shower and a cold bath are usually the best options I have. It's just about being consistent and being diligent with it. It has to be something that you give a fuck about for it to really, really carry over and start making a difference. I mean, 10 minutes a day, 15 minutes a day, every single day really does make a difference. So I mean, don't tell me you didn't have time. If you sat and watched any TV show at all that day, you had time to sit on a lacrosse ball. You had time to stretch between your toes and do some work. So just be consistent with it. That's gonna be the big difference. It's that little bit over a long time is what makes the difference. What's happening guys, Silent Mike, Super Training Gym, Mark Bell's Powercast here answering your question on how to recover from deadlifts. Regardless of your workout program, how you train, uh, even if you have perfect form in the deadlift, often you'll wake up the next day or even that night, get a tight back, sore back, sore glutes, kind of that SI joint, kind of where your, your butt cheek and your low back kind of meet, all that action. 
Um, and the truth is to recover from anything, typically training wise, the best is just to eat well, sleep well, stay hydrated and rest, just take days off. That's why uh, deadlifting every single day is probably not the best idea in the world. Often people, uh, the top deadlifters in the world deadlift once, maybe twice a week. But there are some recovery methods that are similar to maybe uh, supplements where they can help just a little bit. So if you do a little bit, if you have everything else in check, hydration, sleep, nutrition, uh, and controlling your training volume, and then you add in these um, recovery methods, maybe they'll take you uh, five, two, three percent um, further in your recovery. A couple things that I use, the simple ones are just rolling out uh, or getting moving again. So active recovery. The day after deadlifts, don't just sit on the couch all day long. Uh, maybe do some banded good mornings, some hip circle walks, um, even just going for a, a brisk walk in the morning, uh, five to 20 minutes. It doesn't have to be cardio, it doesn't have to be anything crazy, but just get blood flowing again. Uh, my favorite are Epsom salt baths. Just soaking in a hot tub sometimes can relieve some of that uh, tightness in your low back. I also use a stim machine called the Compex. There's a bunch of stim machines out there, but basically it's, it's doing the exact same thing as going for a walk, but for us lazy guys, uh, it'll just send pulses to your muscle, making your muscles flex, flushing out the area of anything that's going on in there, tightness, inflammation, lactic acid, that kind of stuff. There's tons of different supplements in the world, actual like uh, uh, nutritional supplements. I'm not a huge fan of many of them, uh, but something like glutamine, BCAAs, creatine, different stuff like that may help. Uh, but in my opinion, the best actual supplement is just staying hydrated, uh, maybe some electrolytes. That's how I recover from low back pain uh, after deadlifting. Another one of the questions we're getting is about overtraining. How do you know if you're overtrained? Well, your CNS starts getting fatigued. You almost feel too tired to sleep is something I get like, my brain's not working. Where I start struggling is if I can type well, if I can, sentences start to really struggle. That's when I know my CNS is really trashed. So. Keep an eye out for that, and everyone's overtraining level is gonna be different depending on what you're doing. I mean, if I tried to enter to do what a marathon runner is currently doing, I would be overtrained very, very quickly, whereas they would not. If they tried to jump into my strength training, they would be overtrained very quickly. So you have to build this real steady incline of this work base that you're gonna be using throughout your season, throughout your career, throughout your life of training. And that's where you can start to determine your overtraining. And mine's gonna vary depending on time of year. If I tried to go throw right now, three days a week, I'd be in real trouble, I'd be gassed. But late in the season, I can throw four days a week and compete once and have no real trouble. So overtraining's a little relative. There isn't some X amount of number, but the thing you can do is always eat more, sleep more, and be smart about your training. So remember what lifts you can do that are gonna fry the CNS and which ones aren't. For example, like bodybuilding movement type stuff like that, like kind of the chasing the pump shit. This does not fry my CNS the same way 90 plus percent on squats and deadlifts do. Or cleans and snatch where I really need everything to fire fast and fire on point. So those things are gonna be vastly different. So. Make sure your training is playing into the thing that you want to compete in or that what you want to train for. For natural power lifters, do I think four days is usually optimal for proper recovery? I really hate any question that has to do with natural or not, to be super, super honest with you. I think it's gonna depend on you. I think it's gonna depend on all these other variables about how much you sleep, how much you eat, how, how you train. Do you train like an asshole? Do you recover well? Do you do all these other things? that can help aid in your recovery. But do I think a four day split is, is very good for powerlifting? Yes, I think it's ideal. I think you can do a bench day, a squat day, a deadlift day, and then an accessory day. There's a ton of different programs you can try. Uh, you can follow my program, which is a three day a week. You can do four day a week. You can bench, squat, deadlift, and overhead press the second day for your, for, or your fourth day for an accessory. There are a ton of different ways for you to do this and the best way that's gonna do it is the one that works for you. What isn't gonna work for you is a routine where say you never squat or you never deadlift or you are a raw lifter who trains like a guy who's in gear. Train what's right for you, be a little bit smart about it but at the end of the day, it's a lot gonna matter on you and how well you believe in that program that you're on and the people that you're surrounding yourself with. If you're by yourself, know damn sure what you're doing and believe in it. That's really my recommendation. Don't put as much emphasis on drugs as you think. Look at Jesse Norris. 
That's really all I gotta say. That guy's fucking amazing. He's been drug tested a shitload and would just beat the shit out of me on the platform. So follow what that guy's doing. Any recovery supplements that would recommend for a 40 year old besides fish oil and water? I have a couple. Um, Max Adrenal. Not just because those guys support me, which they do, but it's awesome. Check that stuff out. There's a link below and some discounts. Treat yourself that way. Fish oil and water are awesome. And those should be like the big parts of your triangle. Now the rest of this shit is gonna add to that. So Max Adrenal is not a joint supplement, but it's definitely gonna help in your recovery. Another the one they sell is Max Sleep. The more that you sleep, the better quality of sleep you have, the better your recovery is gonna be. This is when your body is going to rebuild and get more awesome. I'm not a doctor. Other than that, Super Sysis from USP Labs has been a great product for me that really does aid in my joints. Um, take some BCAAs while you're training. I notice a huge help from that. Other than that, look at your diet. If you're really struggling with not recovering, maybe you're not eating enough. Those are pretty common things that keep coming up. Is your diet on point? Is your training the right way? Are you sleeping enough? So those are your things and those are my going to be my big recommendations for recovery are those. Also Aleve. Aleve is a great supplement. I don't know if it's a supplement, but it's fucking awesome. Hey, what's going on everybody? My name is Brendan. You're here in my basement. So first of all, a warm welcome to you. If this is your first time down here, but the purpose of this video today is to address a question that one of you had on Matt Vincent's Q&A on Instagram. And the question I chose to address was wrist and forearm pain when it comes to squatting. Now, before we get into it, even though this is likely your first time in the basement, hopefully not the last, I can guarantee we won't have any Buffalo Bill type moments down here. It rubs the lotion on its skin or else it gets the hose again. Yes, you will, precious. You will get the hole. Unless you're into that kind of thing, in which case I'll get the lotion. Let's get to the question. All right, so let's try to keep this answer fairly simple, but one thing should be said is anytime you're experiencing issues in the gym or outside of the gym that's causing you pain, it's usually Mother Nature's way of telling you you're doing something wrong and you should stop doing it. Now, in the case of in the gym with squats and wrist and forearm pain, it's an indicator that we're putting ourselves in a weaker position that over time is going to hurt us. So what is a strong position when it comes to squats with your wrists and your forearms? Well, that's a position that's going to keep them in line as much as possible because this is a much stronger position than something like this. Now think, for example, if you're going to be throwing a punch, you want that in line so you can push as much power as you can. If you have a wrist that's either pushed up or pushed down, that number one, first of all, if you're throwing a punch, is not going to be a very effective punch. And number two, you're probably gonna hurt yourself and break your wrist. Now with squatting, we wanna maintain that position again, everything in a straight line, that's going to be the most powerful. And that's true of any lifting that you're doing. Your wrist and your forearm should be in the same general direction. Now for this, the three things we're gonna talk about are your grip width, your bar position, and your own individual mechanics and mobility. So first things first, let's talk about grip width. Now a general rule of thumb says to use a grip width slightly beyond shoulder width apart. But what I'm gonna tell you is try to use whatever grip you can that's as close as you can as long as you're able to, again, maintain that strong position. Now that's going to vary for everybody. The first thing I'm gonna show you is if we just stick to conformity of normal rules, say just slightly outside shoulder width, for me, someone who doesn't have the best mobility, this is not going to go very well, spoiler alert. So I'm gonna use a narrow grip. I'm gonna go ahead and get into a somewhat of a high bar position. And as you can see here, even though the weight is not on the bar, I'm still trying to struggle to get in position. And when I do, Technically, the bar is on my traps where it should be, but take a look at where my wrists are in relation to my elbows. That is not pretty, my friends. So, what do I have to do? I have to go ahead and widen my grip. However, on the other extreme, let's say I take too wide of a grip. Now, in this case, getting into position, very easy for me to do. Unrack the bar. You can see that my wrists and forearms are in line. The problem is now is my upper body is still very loose. So again, the general rule of thumb is use as narrow grip as you can to remain as tight as you can while still maintaining that grip and position. Not really doing it right here. I feel like I could fly away. 
So that's too much of a good thing. And you'll especially see that as you start to progress with heavier weights, that'll be very hard to keep the load on your back. So for me, what I found works best is a grip that's almost a little bit slightly inside what I use for benching. Allows me to get into position fairly easy. Allows me to unrack the bar. And again, in this case, I'm a lot tighter and my grip's a lot more narrow. So I feel a lot better overall in this position. So that's one thing to look at is your grip width. So in addition to grip width, one of the other things we said we had to look at was bar position. Because if I am to take where I was just gripping the bar for my high bar squat, and then try to translate that into a low bar position, which is a couple inches lower on my back, the results might not necessarily be the same. So as I start to try to get into this position, and for low bar, I'm trying to put the bar more on my rear delts. I can finally get there, stand up, step back. And as you can tell here, now my wrists are jacked back. So even though this grip width position works for high bar, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's gonna transition well to a low bar squat. So not only do you have to pay attention to your grip width, but also again, where the bar is placed. Now for me on high bar, again, slightly inside where my bench press grip is, for low bar, I'll move that out to probably slightly a little bit wider than where I bench. So a pretty wide grip, because again, for me, somebody with very mad mobility in my shoulders, I'm gonna try to work the bar down some. And in this case, I can do that, unrack the bar, and now my wrists are in a better position, but what you can probably still see is there's still some play here. And that's kind of a standard feeling with low bar squats, especially when most people switch from high bar to low bar, they start to get a lot of wrist and forearm pain. One of the things that I can tell you that will also help, first of all, it'll help if I rack the bar, is when you set up for that grip position, take a look at where your thumbs are too. Many people find using a false grip or a thumbs out grip works a lot better and it doesn't really jack your wrists up as much because you get some play on the bar, step back, and then here you go. So same grip width as you just saw, but in this case, my wrists are in a slightly better position. Now, obviously, like I said, your individual mobility is going to play a huge role in this as your grip width and bar position is going to vary about what's comfortable and what not. So definitely try to play around with it some. One of the things I would really suggest you guys do is film from this kind of angle, see exactly what looks good, and of course, what feels good overall. In addition to having to untuck your thumbs from the bar, another thing a lot of people do is wear wrist wraps when they squat, because that's going to help keep your wrist in that stronger position. So there you go. Hopefully that answers your question. Back to you, Matt. So here's one. How is it possible for natties to train body parts, movements, I'm sorry, body parts slash movements multiple times a week, especially someone whose doms, especially for legs, last for a couple days? <sighs> Back to the drug thing. It's not that big of an issue, I promise. Um, you're gonna have to build that base. I mean, it may take a long time for your body to get conditioned to the type of training that you wanna do. If you wanna train multiple times a week, you're gonna to have to start pretty light and get your body used to training that body part a couple times a week. Um, it's gonna suck. That's the thing. There is no trick. There is no secret remedy to this. I don't know what you, like best case scenario, what you hope an answer would be. I mean, the answer is fucking do your recovery work so that you're, legs don't bother you as bad and get in and train anyway maybe have a lighter day the second day or do something different that's the key it's not just squatting 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 it's doing something a little different to hit things a little different way think of one day as a main movement the other day as an accessory and if you're doing more of bodybuilding style training then think maybe one day is going to be a big compound list and the other one's going to be your specific muscle groups or do one after the other. There's a lot of different splits, but you've got to figure out what works for you. And that's a big response. Make sure you're fucking eating. Make sure you're getting plenty of sleep, plenty of water. Make sure you're drinking shit during training. I realize this is the same answer for everything, but that's what recovery is. It's those things are the things that make the biggest difference for your recovery, no matter what body part they are. So thanks for checking that out. I know that's a long video, but there's a lot of great information. And one of the things that's always great to see is, <clears throat> you know, guys like Mike or guys like Brandon or myself, we all have the same info and that's gonna be the same whether it's coming from me or it's coming from guys like Kelly Starrett or anyone. The big picture items are gonna be hydration, they're gonna be sleep, and they're gonna be how well are you eating. 
training volume and those type of things can fluctuate and vary, but you've got to be smart about it too. You can't deadlift 100 sets of deadlifts every day and think that you're going to recover. You just can't. So being a little smart with your training as well as doing these other things are going to make a giant difference in your recovery. I hope some of these questions, hope some of these answers uh, address some of the things you guys had going on. I know I didn't get to everything, but some of the questions were very, very similar. And I think this covers a big range of recovery topics and what you could be doing to make yours better. So thanks for hanging out. Enjoy. Also, check out Hate Brand Goods. The link below. Brandon and Mike's channel links below are also there. Check those guys out. Support them. They're awesome. Not that they need my help. <clears throat> and, um, oh, Black Friday sale. Still going on through Monday. Uh... Heat 15 for 15% off. And uh, sweaters are still some available. I think we've got about 20 or less. So if you want a sweater with the embroidered double pistols, get on that. And thanks again. You guys have been awesome.